Taiwan's COVID wave nears its peak, but plans to scrap the quarantine are still on track. A show of force, the US and South Korea carry out joint drills in response to North Korea's ballistic missile launch. Also ahead. I'm McLeod for Taiwan Plus here at Linko Power Park with a report on whether Taiwan's reliance on fuel imports to generate the country's electricity is a national security concern. Plus, candidates in northern Taiwan join forces to try and convince voters ahead of November's local elections. A warm welcome to Taiwan Plus News. I'm Ian Kavat. Taiwan's defense minister has warned that the country is facing an unprecedented military challenge from China. Speaking in the national legislature, Chou Guozhang said Beijing hopes to normalize military activities near Taiwan. This includes crossing the median line of the Taiwan Strait, an unofficial line between the two countries that had served as a buffer for decades. Fei国际水域 the U.S. and South Korea have carried out joint military drills in a display of force after North Korea test-fired a ballistic missile over Japan on Tuesday. South Korea's military said it mobilized fighter jets and dropped a pair of guided bombs on a target off its west coast to show their precision strike capability. The U.S. sent four fighter jets to take part in the drills. Pyongyang's intermediate-range ballistic missile flew over Japan and landed in the Pacific early on Tuesday morning, prompting Japan to issue warnings for people to take shelter. The U.S.-Taiwan defense industry conference in Washington, D.C. wrapped up on Tuesday with plans for further cooperation between the two sides. U.S. defense officials and the Taiwan contingent, led by the deputy defense minister, held talks on security in the strait. The two sides discussed building up Taiwan's combat readiness and explored how Washington could step up support. For more, our reporter Jaime Ocon spoke to retired Major General Richard Hu. I think it's really important because of, uh, for a very long period of time, uh, Taiwan uh, military have been isolated uh, because of uh, 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 we are not being viewed as a uh, uh, sovereign uh, state. Uh, so actually, uh, the connections of the uh, foreign uh, military are still in a very limited areas and also a very uh, small number of uh, occasions. So it's very important if uh, we could uh, create that kind of uh, defense uh, conference uh, with the United States, uh, because the United States, uh, 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 for sure, is a uh, hyper power, uh, especially in its uh, military strength. A, a recent report came out saying that Taiwan's military could face a recruitment problem because the over age, the over 18 population is forecast to decline um, due to the country's low birth rate. What do you think the Taiwan's military should do to handle a possibility of lower troop numbers? This threat uh, from the other side uh, concerning a potential full-scale invasion by China to reunify Taiwan is looking more likely uh, to happen within the next two to ten years, according to a number of uh, researchers. If Taiwan still wants to maintain its current uh, force level, it will be uh, necessary to extend the duration of mandatory military service. Because in 2022, this year, Taiwan recorded its lowest ever birth rate. 
especially like people are considering the most effective resistance uh, for Taiwanese military will be the, like urban warfare. Urban warfare is uh, uh, depend, depends on uh, military technology, uh, weapon systems. Only men can be conscripted into Taiwan's military, but there have been calls for women to also be included in conscription. How significant is that in terms of the overall troop numbers? I think uh, currently the military uh, has a ratio of uh, female soldiers, uh, the number is around 14 percent. And so we have, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, female soldiers in our military. Uh, however, if uh, we are going to adapt the, uh, the new one, uh, like uh, uh, including uh, female, male, all them, they need to uh, do the uh, compulsory service. Uh, that will be a kind of uh, uh, scaling uh, major, I believe, to Taiwanese people. Because for a long, long time, uh, especially in uh, Taiwanese culture, uh, they believe uh, it's depend on uh, their decision uh, for female where if they would uh, join the uh, military. And even uh, for male, uh, when, they, uh, uh, when they are considered in, uh, to join the military. One of Taiwan's top economic officials says it's unrealistic for Taiwan to completely decouple from China, despite the country's efforts to reduce economic dependence on Beijing. Chen Zhenqi told reporters that Taiwan would use the CHIP4 alliance of semiconductor manufacturing countries, the US, Taiwan, Japan and South Korea, to bolster Taiwanese chip companies' global position. Tan added that he believes Taiwan's system is resilient against Chinese economic influence and that Chinese efforts to poach Taiwanese chip talent are not effective. I don't see, frankly, in the uh, near term, we can uh, completely decouple from China. That's not uh, realistic. So we will continue to see our companies working with their Chinese counterparts for business re, uh, activities. But with respect to national security, we will take measures, uh, including safeguard our trade secrets, safeguard our uh, key national key uh, technologies, uh, safeguard our talent not to be poached illegally. U.S. chipmaker Micron Technology has announced plans to build what it says will be the world's largest semiconductor facility. The company will invest $100 billion U.S. dollars over 20 years to build the factory complex in the state of New York. The project is part of a push to boost U.S. semiconductor production and make the country more competitive with China. In August, President Joe Biden signed the Chips and Science Act, a bill that will see 52.7 billion US dollars in subsidies for the US semiconductor industry. Now, as Taiwan faces rising military pressure from China, experts are flagging the country's reliance on fuel imports as a potential national security concern. Today, in part two of our special series on energy powering Taiwan, Rick Lowert asks what Taiwan is doing to make sure it can keep the lights on. This is Linko Power Plant on the northwest coast of Taiwan's main island. It produces nearly 5% of the country's power and runs off imported coal, which isn't the only energy source Taiwan imports. Ports like these see the arrival of coal, oil, natural gas and nuclear fuel, supplying Taiwan's 26 power plants and producing more than 90% of the country's fuel. If the country lost access to these sources, it could soon struggle to keep the lights on. It's a scenario now being seriously considered, since neighboring China has ramped up threats to invade Taiwan and conducted drills that appeared to test their ability to blockade the island. These six areas are where China's People's Liberation Army, or PLA, conducted live fire exercises in August. And these are Taiwan's major ports. I think the first thing is that Taiwan is an island surrounded by the ocean. So look at, you know, ocean, if you are uh, blocked by the PLA, 
by its own, uh, its own uh, that, you know, that means that the island is really kind of, you know, selected. Like what I say, you know, perhaps we have to preserve as much as we can right before the war starts. Taiwan's government hopes to spend an unprecedented 19 billion US dollars on defense in 2023 as it pursues asymmetric warfare, tactics to deter attacks from a much larger foe. To ensure the safety of our shipping lands in wartime, our sea navy will dispatch forces to secure state lands or escort vessels in the needed water. The economics ministry says it manages stockpiles of fuel, which could be used in the event of a blockade. Taiwan has enough coal to last 30 days and natural gas 11 days. Oil stored by state and private companies could last 140 days. But the vulnerability has also given impetus to Taiwan in boosting its green energy, such as solar power plants and wind farms, which currently only supply 6% of its electricity. <laughs> The rising threat from China looms large, but just as Taiwan must rely on its own military to ensure its defense, it may also need to look inward to keep the power going. Andy Shue, Patrick Chen, Peachy Zhuang and Rick Lowert for Taiwan Plus. Join us on Friday for part three of our special series on energy, Powering Taiwan. Louise Watt looks at why something turning off nuclear power does not bode well for Taiwan's energy or national security. Taiwan's Premier Su Zhengtang says the government will investigate allegations that the head of the Atomic Energy Council verbally and physically harassed female staff. As Jean Van Trieste reports, it's a decision welcomed by women's rights advocates. Atomic Energy Council head Xie Shoxing, seen here in the tabloid Mirror Media, is being accused of verbally abusing and inappropriately touching women who work for him. In a series of articles, Mirror Media also says Xie had outbursts and bullied colleagues. Xie denies his behavior crossed the line into bullying or harassment and says he is willing to cooperate with any investigation. The cabinet is taking him at his word and setting up a committee to examine the allegations. Women's rights groups say taking the matter out of the Atomic Energy Council's hands is the right move. The cabinet has promised a speedy investigation, with a premier pledging to defend safe, equal workplaces for all. Kama Xu and John Van Trieste for Taiwan Plus. Taiwan is pressing ahead with plans to reopen its borders. That's despite rising COVID cases. As the country moves towards a new living with COVID strategy, the government has also announced plans to roll back the amount of money it's providing for the Centers for Disease Control. But the new budget is not without controversy. Ryan Hoker Patrick reports. A nation in transition. Taiwan is moving ahead with its policy shift to living with COVID. Reopening borders later this month and trimming down the budget for the Centers for Disease Control. But the road back to normal continues to be bumpy, with members of the opposition Kuomintang lambasting the government for what, on paper, is the CDC's highest ever budget at 84.5 billion Taiwan dollars. That's the equivalent of nearly 2.7 billion US dollars. But the ruling Democratic Progressive Party says this is a deliberate distortion. The budget is actually around 1 billion less than last year. The only difference is it's now part of the regular annual budget, rather than a separate special budget like the past few years.
COVID-19 cases are still on the rise in Taiwan, reaching a new all-time high of nearly 55,000 on October 5th. But the country's health authorities say this has not deterred them from a much-awaited reopening of the borders after some two and a half years of isolation from the rest of the world. But health authorities also insist they're not letting their guard down when it comes to COVID. 400,000 new doses of the antiviral pill Paxlovid are due to arrive at the end of the week. And the rollout of the second generation Moderna vaccine has progressed to stage two, open to over 50s, as well as medical and aviation workers. As Taiwan continues to plot its post-pandemic course, officials hope to reassure people that the time has come to learn to live with COVID. Ryan Hill Kilpatrick for Taiwan Plus. Coming up after the break. I'm Rick Glatt for Taiwan Plus, here with Taiwan's elite honor guard as they practice for the upcoming National Day Parade. Welcome back. You're watching Taiwan Plus News. Taiwan celebrates its National Day this coming Monday. The government has officially unveiled the theme for this year's event. Yo as part of this year's event, there will be a showcase of Taiwan's military equipment, as well as performances by local schools and dance troops. Other festivities include a fireworks display in southern Taiwan's Jiayi that night. Taiwan's military orchestra and honor guard have wrapped up their final rehearsal for the National Day celebrations. The parade is all about precision, and as Rick Lau reports, it's not for the faint-hearted. Pomp and pageantry is of course a key part of Taiwan's National Day Parade. The military's national band and elite honor guard have been practicing their music and rifle spinning skills for five months. Every note and every movement must be executed with precision when they march in front of the presidential office on October 10th. The Honor Guard is a special part of Taiwan's military, protecting key buildings and personnel and performing in national ceremonies. There are strict criteria for entry. 
Soldiers must be between 178 and 190 centimetres tall, weighing between 65 and 80 kilograms, and have what's called a dignified appearance with an approved face shape. They are trained to stand perfectly still for 50 minutes at a time. This year's National Day celebrations are taking place at a time of heightened tensions with China and come just months after Beijing launched unprecedented live fire drills around Taiwan in response to a visit from US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Taiwan's National Day Parade is a chance for the country to showcase its military might and this year to champion its culture and define its geopolitical position. The display being perfected here today is not just about putting on a good performance. It's a chance to show the rigor and discipline of the armed forces and an opportunity to reassure the public that Taiwan can stand up to China's increasing threat. Damon Lin and Rick Lowert in Taipei for Taiwan Plus. Russian President Vladimir Putin has signed four laws annexing four Ukrainian regions. But the move to formally absorb 15% of Ukraine comes even as Russian forces are struggling to keep control in those very regions. Louise Watt reports. Ukrainian forces hoist their country's flag in a town in southern Ukraine recaptured from Russian occupiers. It's another sign that Russia's troops are under mounting pressure. In Donetsk, a region to the east, Ukrainian troops drive Russian trucks. This uh, technique uh, comes from Liman. It's Russian, uh, uh, Russian vehicle. And uh, now uh, this uh, machine uh, will work for our uh, armed forces. Ukrainian forces have been expanding their offensive since capturing Liman a strategically important town in Donetsk. Moscow proclaimed only last week it had annexed the regions of Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia and Kherson. And on Wednesday, in defiance of international law, Russian President Vladimir Putin signed laws formally making the regions part of Russia. But parts of all four are still in Ukrainian hands. And Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says the country's army is advancing quickly in the south and that dozens of settlements have been retaken from Russian forces in all the four regions. As Moscow struggles to hold on to the large area of Ukraine it says it's annexed, at this point in the war, more than seven months in, momentum appears to be on Ukraine's side. Patrick Chen and Louise Watt for Taiwan Plus. The Philippines Journalist Union has staged a protest over the murder of broadcaster and government critic Percival Mabasa. The 63-year-old, who went by the broadcast name Percy Lapid, was gunned down near Manila on Monday while driving. His radio programs had criticized both the current president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., and his predecessor, Rodrigo Duterte. He is the second journalist to be killed since Marcos Jr. took office in June. The Philippines is considered one of the world's most dangerous countries for reporters. The union says nearly 200 have been killed since dictator Ferdinand Marcos Sr. was deposed in 1986. With less than two months to go before Taiwan's local elections, candidates in northern cities are, and counties are combining their efforts. Eric Gao has the details. Hitting the campaign trail together. Candidates from the ruling Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, are pulling their efforts for local elections in key northern areas, which include the country's capital and its most populous city. The DPP hopefuls have signed a joint statement on how the neighboring local governments can work together to improve transportation, environmental, and economic ties. Candidates from the main opposition Guomingdang or KMT are also stumping together in the same region. 
They're gearing up for a joint policy presentation in November. So it's not just the major parties that are consolidating their supporters. Independent and smaller party candidates are also looking to integrate their campaigns. Taiwanese will head to the polls on November 26th in local elections widely seen as a referendum on the ruling party's domestic policies. The DPP has won the past two national elections on a platform of promoting Taiwanese identity and keeping an arm's length from China. But it stumbled at the previous local elections in 2018 when its domestic agenda came to the fore. The results from the key capital region this year will show how far the party has come and will set the stage for 2024's presidential election. Rick E and Eric Gao for Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. Remember to download the Taiwan Plus app for more stories from Taiwan and around the world. Finally, we leave you with images of the Museum of Islamic Art in Qatar reopening its doors after 18 months of being closed for a relaunch and reinstallation project. I'm Ian Kavat. Take care and see you next time.